So the title of, of session one, the title of session one that I want to do for 2 Timothy, and we're going to focus on chapter one, is coming straight from the text. Guarding the good deposit. If you want to have a title for session one, the title that I've uh, landed on is just straight from the text, and we'll get to that. It's guarding the good deposit. What I also want to do is I want to give you a bit of a, a roadmap of what we're going to accomplish in this first session. And there's going to be three questions that I want to present right now and that I will answer through the, the expository preaching of God's word is these three questions. Number one, what of Paul? That's the question number one. Question number two, what of Timothy? What about Timothy? And then question number three, why does Paul write to Timothy? Those are the three questions that we will be taking a look at with regard to chapter 1. So let's go ahead, and in honor of God's word, I'm going to read it in its entirety. So why don't we all stand together, and uh, I'm going to read through chapter 1. I'm just going to read through it without stopping, and I just want us to have a moment to just enjoy the chapter. Can we do that? I'll read it, you listen along, and uh, then we'll sit down again and, and go through chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1, I'm reading from the uh, ESV version. You, of course, there's going to be a variety of different versions out there. I'm, I'm using the ESV version. It says this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father... In Christ Jesus, our Lord, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith. A faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and, now, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel." For which, I, for which I was appointed a preacher and apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until the day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Here's that title of my message. Guard 
the good deposit entrusted to you. You are all aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are uh, Phagellus and Hermogenes. I, I was practicing that one before I got here. Just roll with it, right? Just roll with it. May the Lord, it's like, it's like some of those Cajun names down there, Uncle Dennis. It's just You just got to roll with it. May the Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus. We got that one. There we go. For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You guys can go ahead and be seated. What a great chapter. Let's answer question number one. What about Paul? What about Paul? So this is that infamous, likely final letter that Paul writes. If you go back and you take a look in verse 16 and 17, where I started to butcher some of those names, you get some sort of indication that he's in Rome. If you take a look at verse 17, but when he arrived in Rome. So in all likelihood, Paul is an inmate. He's in prison. In fact, go back to verse 8. If you see in verse 8, he refers to himself as God's prisoner. He says, do not be ashamed about, of the testimony about of, uh, our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. We recognize that he's in prison, but he actually is not only in prison, he's in chains in all likelihood. He's not doing well. He's in in prison, he's in chains, and it, it's in verse 16 you can actually see the indication that there are people that are actually ashamed of the fact that, oh, there goes Paul again. He's in prison. Ha, he's too bold. He's run amok again. He's run his mouth. He's back in prison. In fact... You can just go ahead and go into chapter 2 and verse 9. It says that he's actually bound with chains in verse 9, chapter 2, as a criminal. So he's in chains, the kind of chains where you can picture him in this prison of sorts, not really free, like maybe there were some indications in some of the other prison ep epistles that he had sense of freedom and movement, has a bit more of like, man, this is a little bit harder than normal. In 1 Timothy, if you go and just take a look, 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, Paul, although it has that notion of like imprisoned, he, he had a sense that he was mobile and that he was had an expectation that he was going to kind of be able to get moving, be able to move about. Second Timothy has this Roman orientation where he's in. <laughs> and uh, it has a sense of finality. He also really feels abandoned by most of his friends. Take a look back at verse 15. Verse 15, he says, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. That's fascinating. Considering that he had a lot of ministry that was taking place there, that even at one point reported that all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And he has this sense that those types of individuals, they're abandoning him. They're not sticking close to him. He's awaiting execution. It feels like it's the end of his ministry. There's a tone of finality to it. Let's go ahead and jump to chapter 4. Just take a look at the sense of finality in chapter 4, 
verses 6 through 8. We, those of you who've been around church, you, you've heard this all the time. Just think about it with regard to his context of being in prison and abandoned. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. You see that there's this sense of finality. He has had years, friends, years of preaching the good news. Years of planting churches. It's so much fun to just go through the book of Acts and to enjoy the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul and seeing all the places that he goes. The amount of times that he's dodged all sorts of crowds and chaos and things of that nature and, and actually also at times faced them head on. He's awaiting his education. What would you do if you found yourself in a similar situation? In prison, feeling abandoned, had just had maybe three decades worth of wonderful ministry. What would you do? I miss uh, Auntie Beck and Uncle Dennis. I miss my, grandpa my grandfather's. My grandfathers, nobody in the Wilton household were Christians until at the age, I think, of 32. My grandfather, John Wilton, a mighty preacher of the gospel, one of my all-time favorite ministers of the gospel, in South Africa, loving racing uh, his motorcycles and playing tennis and golf and and my grandmother, Rotabel, isn't that a wonderful name, Rotabel? My grandmother, Rotabel, Granny as I called her, uh, having all sorts of fun at the country clubs and the theaters and, and participating. Nothing wrong with any of those things. But they thought that that was the essence of life. And they were dramatically converted. Dramatically converted. And then they were on a pathway towards honoring and serving the Lord with however the Lord would lead them. He passed on recently, like a couple years back, and I wasn't there. I was serving as a missionary in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He went to the hospital. I wasn't there. I wanted to be. That was hard. It was hard not to be there for my grandfather in his final moments. My brother got to go there. He was there with him. Luckily, because of technology, I had some FaceTime type of moments in his final moments in the, in the hospital. What would you do if it was your final moments? We know what Papa did. Papa was teaching my brother Rob things that God was showing him through the book of Romans. As he was in the hospital, nearing and knowing it was the end of his life. What a wonderful thought that is flooding through my brain. A thought of such warmth to know that my grandfather, John Wilton, is learning about the book of Romans before he goes to glory. My other grandfather... Edwin Bolton, or as we affectionately called him, Bumpa. Isn't that a great grandfather's name? Bumpa. He died in 2020. He died in 2020 and it was connected to everything that was taking place with COVID. He lived in a nursing home. We weren't able to physically be with him. We had to visit him through a window, didn't get to hug him, we got to visit him through a window, that was my interaction with him on his last few times that I got to be together with him, but man would he sing, he would sing through that window, he would sing that song to my my kids, his precious great-grandchildren, 
Jesus loves me. Jesus loves the little children. My favorite one, I've got a video of it. It's an old song that he would sing. I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. And he would say, sing that again. If you follow me, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men if you follow me. I have that as an echo in my mind of my dear grandfather, Bumpa, right before he went to glory. You know, there's a preciousness to things when you know it's coming to an end. I speculate that Paul knew this, even go back to verse 1. There's a uniqueness to this introduction that I think in a way, and I'm speculating here, is, is unique that it's not in other epistles. Look at that phrase in verse 1. It just says, according to the promise of the life. Somebody say life. Of the life that is in Christ Jesus. See him not only writing that to Timothy, but see him writing that to himself. Of the promise of the life. Life now and the life to come that is in Christ Jesus. So what does Paul do? With a sense of finality, he writes to Timothy. That's what he decides to do. So, question then number two is this. What about Timothy? This is Paul. This is his context. This is who he is. He's the one that is writing it. This is the inspired, infallible, and errant word of God that we have received. And these are the people that the Lord has used... To give us this wonderful, precious book. So we have this one person in verse 1, Paul. But then in verse 2, it says to Timothy. What about Timothy? He refers to him in verse 2. Take a look at it. What does he call him? My beloved child. Now, it's not actually his child, but it is definitely his spiritual son in the faith. You know... Timothy is from Lystra. In fact, if you go to Acts chapter 16, you get a little bit of an insight into Timothy. He is the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but also was from a Greek father. That's Acts 16 and verse 1. If you remember in 2 Timothy chapter 1... And verse 5, Paul provides a recollection, a warmth of a recollection, the way I did with Bumpa and Papa, with regard to his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice's faith. A sincere, wonderful faith that he believes is in them, in, in Timothy as well. You see, the fun part about Timothy is that Timothy went on journeys with Paul. Those are some incredible journeys. Can you imagine being one of the, uh, the traveling companions? Luke probably had a pretty cool role. Can you imagine being Luke, getting to hang out and record all that the Lord was doing in those different types of journeys? If you look in Acts 16 and Acts 20, you see that uh, Timothy is one of those that accompanies Paul on his journeys. Paul actually says of Timothy that there is no one like him. That happens in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, let me read it for you. Let me tell you from Philippians 2 <coughs> the level of reverence that the older Paul has for the younger Timothy. He says this in Philippians 2, 20. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to the church of Philippi to send Timothy to you soon. So that I too may be cheered by news of you. Look what Paul says. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, 
not those of Jesus Christ, but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. That's a pretty good recommendation and commendation, I think. He's functioning in addition as a bit of an apostolic delegate. So he is functioning in a, in a sense as like a delegate. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1. That one, it says, when Paul's writing, he says, we, t- we sent Timothy. Paul, man, Paul, he's, who should I say? Oh, t- yeah, Timothy, let's send Timothy. And he's going to come, and it says in that verse right there, to establish and to exhort you. He also does that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. It says to the church at Corinth, This is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. Additionally, Timothy is also included in like the introductions of some of the other letters where it says Paul and Timothy, Paul and Timothy. It says that in Philemon, Philippians, and Colossians. So to summarize this real quick, Timothy is Paul's spiritual son. He's extremely familiar with Paul's life and ministry. And he's fully capable and to an extent competent to continue the ministry of Paul. So then that gets us then to this third question that I have for us with this first session. What of Paul? What of Timothy? Question number three. So why then does Paul write Timothy? Can I say something that is a little bit Captain Obvious? Life ends for us all one day. going to end there's some young people in the house are like yeah that ain't coming that ain't happening any of us uh, i turned 40 last week i'm i'm on that side you know the hill right here and this guy i crossed it i just crossed it so i could say i'm on this side right you, you all of us who are on this side right i could say i'm on that side now right we had that sense that life would just go on forever and it just kind of felt like but doesn't it go by like a flash Then it just go by super, super quick. You know, the end of things bring reflections. And most of that reflection causes you to think about legacy. What's going to happen with my possessions? What's going to happen with the work that I established with my hands or with my mind? What's going to happen with this or with that? My favorite missionary is C.T. Studd. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of that name before. C.T. Studd. That's my favorite missionary from England. He was like the Babe Ruth, the uh, all-star for that crazy quasi-baseball looking game called cricket. He left it all, joined this famous group that was called the Cambridge Seven. And he left it all to go and serve with another famous missionary called Hudson Taylor with the China Inland Mission. Went and served there for a while, left, got married, served in India, visited the U.S. a little bit, but then finally landed in Africa and spent the last few decades of his life serving in the heart of Africa. Let me give you a quote that I have never forgotten the moment I heard it. C.T. Studd said this, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Paul writes Timothy because he cares deeply about the legacy of the gospel. Why is Paul writing Timothy? He cares deeply about the legacy of the gospel. In many ways, this is a message of leadership succession. 
If you cease to exist, young and old in the room today, what would be left behind? Would it be a great house? Would it be wonderful possessions? What would be left behind? Would it be nice saints' clothes? What would be left behind? Would there be anything of substance that would be left behind if all of a sudden you ceased to exist? See, Paul's concerned with ministry le legacy and he's concerned with preserving the conti continuity of the message. He has been a dynamic recipient of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That Damascus Road experience, that mighty conversion, and then the subsequent ministry that follows. And those of us in ministry, even uh, Brother Dennis and I, we, we talked about this this morning, about me ways in which people measure ministry legacies and how things are left behind and oh wow this church is huge or that person is loved or they written those books or they've done those things but what truly matters this is why i've got for you guys here this morning as we did what of paul what of timothy and then why is he writing this letter i want us to see the four main exhortations in chapter one. We've got four of them, and that's how I'm kind of wrapping up this morning, okay, for this session. Four of them. You see four moments where these are legacy moments, impact. This is, this is the Apostle Paul going, I care deeply about the legacy of the gospel. Pay careful attention to the legacy moments that I'm trying to put into you, Timothy, for the sake and the preservation and the advancement of the gospel. Let's take a look at them. Number one, the fan the flame moment. Did you see that in chapter one? Can you find that one? Chapter one, this moment where he talks about fanning the flame. Look at verse six. He says all these things and then he goes on in verse six. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. I don't know about you guys, but I don't like cold weather. Anybody else here living down here for a reason? My brother lives up in Pittsburgh, and I say, you can have all the Pittsburgh you want. I'll even take that hot, sweltering July heat down in New Orleans. I, of course I'll take that, because I, I just am not one of those guys that can handle the cold weather. I need me a fire if I'm going to have cold weather. Anybody like to sit around a good fire? Yeah, I mean, it's something special just to sit around a good fire. Any, any of you who've been around just like a really good fire, you know that you have to kind of cultivate it. You have to keep it going. And it can be roaring. You can, oh man, you know, you have those proud moments where you light it and you, you're, I felt like I was just the idiot. I could not get that thing light, lit for the, for the love of me. And then finally it does. And it's finally roaring. And I've gotten to where I want it to be. Well, what's happening? It's starting to leave. Starting to change. And I have to do things in order to maintain that, that fire. This is what Paul is saying. Remember your sincere faith. The faith that was in your grandmother and also in your mother. Remember that. And even by the process of remembering it, you are fanning the flame. Remember. Remember that young or old in the house right now, the gospel actually came to you from someone else. Remember the people who have in one way, whether it was by chance or by intentionality, those who have shared the gospel, and poured the gospel into you. Remember it. Fan that flame. I feel that burden at the seminary right now, Uncle Dennis. 
I'm one of those that's there right now in 2022. There's not many of us there anymore. That understands the past generations as we're dealing with the upcoming generation. I don't know about you guys, but I think that the gospel is the same whether it was in the 80s or in the 2020s. Anybody else? The gospel is the same. The word is the same. It is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And because of that, I have this, this sense about me that there are some fun like history, legacy type of things related to the to the levels who, who were, the, he was the president two presidents ago, or to Chuck Kelly, who was the president prior to our current president, Dr. Jamie Dew. There are those types of things. But I, I feel a sense of a burden to fan the flame of the gospel so that those who were before me, who were adamant about the Lord Jesus, that I share that sense of burden right now to fan the flame, the gift of God, the good news. Because I know that there are some 20-year-olds. We have 18-year-olds on the campus right now that are showing up for ministry education. That I'm responsible to do something with regard to them. That's exhortation number one, fan the flame. So... Here's the application, just real quick. It's, it's a, one of those, keep it simple, stupid, because I'm one of those types of guys. Are you fanning the flame? The thing that you have received, are you fanning the flame? We're going to have so many more times to talk about that because it shows up. But are you doing it? Don't sit back and think that Christianity is a passive person's game. Are you fanning it? Number two, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. That's from verse eight. I love that part because we know that what we can gather and collect is that Paul's writing to Timothy in such a way that if he's saying this, guess what he's then implying? there actually are quite a few people that have all of a sudden risen up and are ashamed. They're ashamed. They're ashamed maybe about the testimony about Jesus. It says, do not be ashamed about the testimony about our Lord. That means they're actually potentially, he's implying that there are people who are starting to um, uh, water it down. They're starting to sugarcoat they're starting to say phrases like our culture says, uh, says all the time. What's right for you is right for you. What's right for me is right for me. Let's just all get along. And unfortunately, that's happening with these teacher types. But Paul is saying this. He says, don't be ashamed. He says, don't be ashamed. In fact, don't be ashamed so much so that it says, share in suffering. For the gospel by the power of God. I have a fun thing. I was already talking to Brother Dennis about this. We go into the French Quarter every Monday nights. I teach mostly evangelism and missions classes. That's what I teach. And so I've got this one class, Practice of Evangelism. And we go on Monday nights into the French Quarter. Because we're going to tell some people about Jesus. That's what we're going to do. I was walking past Bourbon on my way to Jackson Square. I was on Dauphine passing bourbon street this guy comes up to me on a bicycle he looks at me and he goes uh you look like you're looking for something like he's trying to okay what are you gonna offer me drugs or you gonna hook me up with something some kind of he says you look like you're looking for something i said sure am i'm looking to find somebody to tell him about jesus and he goes well that's different So we had a nice little gospel conversation there. It was wonderful. It was beautiful. And it was awkward for him, but it was glorious for me because I just had to tell him about Jesus. That's what I had to do. One of the things that we're training our students to do is to have a reaction of saying praise God no matter what their reaction is. I learned that from one of my mentors in the faith. His name was Mike Shipman, and he was a faithful 
and lives back stateside, but he was a faithful missionary in Indonesia responsible for a movement of 30 to 40,000 Muslims who've come to faith in Christ in Indonesia. Isn't that amazing? It's incredible. The hands of like local workers, legitimate stuff that I've seen personally. I've met these individuals and it's, it's without a doubt gospel central in every sense of the way. It's incredible. But one of the things that he trained his local workers to do is to always say praise God even when you get rejected. Inwardly, maybe you'd say it out loud, but praise God. So I'm teaching these students. They go up and they'll walk up to somebody and they'll say some sort of conversation. And that person's reaction will ultimately be, get out of my face. And we're telling them, oh, don't go walk around like this. Don't, don't walk around like, oh, woe is me. Praise God. Praise God. That's what it means to not be ashamed. Oh, it's easy to have all sense of pride, be braggadocious about the Lord Jesus Christ when things are good, but be in prison. Have everybody abandon you and be at the end of your life and then realize, say, oh yeah, I'm still not ashamed. You can be the kind of guy who's like Paul in Romans 1, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of God, for it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Gentile. And that's a really good moment. But this is equally just as good of a moment because we know his context. And he's saying, don't be ashamed. So what about you? That's the application. You know where that shows up? Because we do. You know where that shows up for us today? It shows up for us today when we're really slapped in the face with trying to present Jesus to a society that wants it to be nothing but inclusive. That's when we all of a sudden begin to realize that we deal with feelings of being ashamed as well. Unfortunately, I'm guilty of those things. I need Paul's exhortation, his admonishing to Timothy and also to me, that as I'm dealing with people who don't want me to say Christ is the only way, that I'm asking God to help me not be ashamed. And I hope you're asking him too as well. Let me give you these other ones and we'll kind of wrap up this early session. All right, number three, follow the pattern. Follow the pattern, which is verse 13. So we've had fan the flame, don't be ashamed, and then follow the pattern. I love this pattern, okay? Look what it says in verse 13. It says this, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. You see that? There's a pattern. You've heard sound words from me. Just follow it. Just do that. Okay? The application right here is that the Christian life is more so following the pattern that has been set than trying to create a new one. You want success in your Christian life? It's not necessarily that you all of a sudden have to chart a new course. You just need to stay the course. The gospel is, like I've said, yesterday, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why today we need to follow the pattern of the sound words that is found in this. Just this. Nothing more, nothing less. Just this. We need to continue to follow the old story. Y'all remember that hymn? I love that hymn. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. 
Y'all missing out if you don't like those old hymns. And it's not because I'm all about that throwback life, even though that's fun. I'm about that, that song, because the essence of that song is still true today. Do you understand what I'm getting at? That's why we follow the pattern. The pattern of the old story. The dynamic of the gospel message that Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, he died, he was buried, he came back to life, he walked with his disciples, he ascended into heaven with a promise to return, whoever believes in him shall not die but have everlasting life. That's the pattern. That's the old story. That is the means by which we receive the grace of God. This is important for us to remember that. Don't get cute. Younger people, don't get cute. Follow the pattern. And fourth and finally, guard the good deposit. This is ultimately, if you guys were kind of looking for a bit of like a theme type of verse for 2 Timothy. And that's dangerous to do because sometimes when you do that with different letters and things like that, you can... Uh, then miss some of the essence of the entire letter. But one that grabs at it really well is verse 14 of chapter 1. If you wanted to have like, hey, that's, that's a verse that can kind of help you almost entirely encompass Paul's message to Timothy, is 2 Timothy 1, 14, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you this is the priceless deposit of the gospel of jesus paul has deposited the preciousness of this into timothy and timothy is to guard that preciousness that has been entrusted to him paul reminds timothy there are people around him Church, there are people around you right now who are not guarding the good deposit. They are putting their guards down. They are thinking it's okay to compromise. It's okay to dilute. It's okay to water down. It's okay to do all sorts of things and just not really treat the gospel as truly precious. Don't do that. Paul reminds Timothy that there are those two guys in verse 15 who've done that. Our application then is simply this. Be a guardian then of the good deposit of the gospel. Guard it. We live in an era where people want to ignore it, reject it, add to it, diminish it. No, Paul says don't do any of that. Guard it. That's why, how do we guard it? Okay, the gospel has come to you. You've believed it. How do we guard it? Fan the flame. Don't be ashamed. Follow the pattern. Do all this by the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. Those moments of fanning the flame and... Not being ashamed and following the pattern. We do that because of being empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. Never forget that. So do you have that good deposit in you? Every one of you here, are you sure? Are you certain that you have that good deposit in you? Are you aware that you have the gospel? And if you have the gospel, are you aware you have the most precious, priceless thing deposited into you there is nothing more spectacular than the gospel in you are you guarding it let's go to the lord in prayer heavenly father i thank you so much for this first session just taking a look at first timothy second timothy chapter one i thank you uh, for learning about paul and his circumstance the same for timothy um God, thank you for this letter. Thank you for it being part of your, your canon, your holy word. Uh, thank you so much for 
allowing us to receive these exhortations. May I and may we be the kind of people that fan the flame, that we are not ashamed, that we follow the pattern, and that we guard this good deposit that has been put into us. We love you and we thank you for the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray.